things to consider when planning your wedding. I feel I'm pretty qualified to speak on this subject, as I have personally attended, well, let's just say a lot of weddings. I want to start by saying this is your day, and the most important thing is to make sure both you and your partner agree on everything. Or, at the very least, ensure you're both happy with your respective compromises. So, if you want to serve fish and chips at your wedding, but your future father-in-law is insisting he'll pay for 60 three-course meals, don't budge. Let him pay for the chips, because that's what you want. While we're on the subject, let's talk food. Number one, what's the best wedding food? I can honestly say, hands down, a buffet is the way to go. It can be done with cheap and cheerful, timeless favourites to be enjoyed by the old and the young guests. You can also turn that around and get some high-end canapes, or even a waiter to carry them around. This ensures people are comfortable and can take as little or even as much as they like. Other cool things that I have seen at weddings before, as I've previously said, fish and chips. These particular fish and chips were served in a cone to symbolise the way that the couple had met. They also had a candy floss machine and even a sweet stand. This worked really well as about 30% of the guests attending were of the age of 3 to 14. Also, if you live in Milton Keynes or Northampton, I highly recommend Clark's Confectionery. You can find them on Facebook if you're unsure of which one. Give me a message. Number two, what music should I play for my wedding? Now this is probably a question you already know the answer to, but I'll answer it anyway. Whatever you like. You need to keep in mind that this is a celebration of two individuals uniting. If you're both weirdos that like nothing more than standing dead still while listening to white noise, then do that. I would recommend getting a DJ. I've been to many weddings where I'll be talking away, then all of a sudden one song would end, but the other song never starts. Then typically a bridesmaid or someone from the bridal pie would run over to change the phone as the first one had died. The DJ is a massive part of the night. The last thing you want is to put the responsibility onto a guest. Plus, they usually bring with them all kinds of lights, lasers and even fog machines, creating a complete change in atmosphere. A thing that is often overlooked is the creative control. Trust in the DJ to play what's right. Obviously make a list of all the songs you want to play and let them do the rest. Oh, and if you do see the DJ on a roll, for God's sake, don't let anyone request Agadoo. 3. How to decide who sits with who. You may already know how I played this one at my wedding, and it wasn't because I didn't care. I have seen people having a horrible time because they were sat at a table with people they didn't like. When I got married, I didn't have a seating plan. My guests sat wherever they liked. You can choose to keep everyone away from the crazy ones in your family, but you know what? If you've invited them, they are a part of you. Embrace it. The way my wife and I saw it, we are uniting our families and some will feel more comfortable sitting with the people they know and others will be happy to sit with new people. Just don't force it. Number four, what's the best wedding entertainment? Now, obviously I'm gonna be extremely biased, but even when playing devil's advocate, I can't see anything better than a magician. There are other alternatives, like a four-piece band, but you have a DJ, right? Juggling act, dancers, fire breathers. For what I can see, these are great entertainment, but everyone will see it all at the same time, and it won't last that long. When you book a magician, they weave in and out of the crowd, mingling and bringing people together. 
creating intimate and memorable moments in a one-on-one -on -one setting. This can be repeated for one, two, maybe even three hours, depending on how big the venue and the guests in attendance. The only thing I would say is make sure you know who you're booking. You often get what you pay for, so just bear that in mind. Number five, drink. What everyone needs after the ceremony. I would say when booking the venue, keep an eye out for a bar or if they have a license so you can either bring drinks in or hire a cocktail maker or one of those tiny Prosecco vans. We opted for a bar where the guests can buy their own drinks. There's a preconception that when you go to a wedding everything is bought and paid for by the bride and the groom. The way I see it, you're putting on a cracking party already. Let them get the drinks in. If you really feel like it, you can put a few hundred pounds behind the bar for everyone's first drink. Number six, should I hire a photographer? Personally, I didn't, but I wish I had. To be honest, I documented the day quite well considering, but if I could do it again, I definitely, definitely would have hired a photographer. It was my suggestion to get three Polaroid cameras and some disposable cameras for each table with a sort of Pinteresty label saying something like, help us capture our day. After consulting with a friend of mine, we opted to just keep the Polaroids and ditch the disposable cameras as they're unreliable and apparently you can get a lot of blank rolls. We just told everyone to take as many pictures as possible and to be honest, we got quite a few nice ones. I just wish there were two of me so I could have gotten the shots I wanted. My sister also helped a bunch by making up a photo booth box filled with glasses and fake facial hair like moustaches, things like that. There are loads of pictures of our family and friends having a good laugh with those. Number seven, the venue. We strongly wanted a beach wedding, but was persuaded otherwise. I guess it was a good job really, as there were all sorts of permits needed. Oh, and it rained. Ironic? Pick a venue that would fit all of your guests quite comfortably and ensure you can have it for a period of time before the event so that you can do your own decorating. As stated, try and get a bar in there if you can. And also, if you can get a decent sized dance floor in there, do that. You'd be surprised at the amount of people that will want to dance after they've had their second gin and tonic. Number eight, decorations. If your wedding is some time away, ensure at least once a month you are buying a few decorations. You need to make sure you have something for the tables. We opted for some glass jars that were made to look really nice by Emily's auntie, along with some table confetti and some LED lights. I also included some mason jars filled with sweets and some popcorn cones for the kids to have. Balloons are a must. Just fill the floor with a few packets and make sure you treat yourself to a few beers after you've blown them all up. I know I did. We opted out for chair covers, nothing against them, it just seems like they're a bit of a scam as you have to rent them out. Another thing we did is we went with one of those online photo printing places like Snapfish I think it was, where you just print a whole bunch for free and then I blue tacked those all over the wall, just various pictures of me and Emily over the time that we've been together. Number 9. Speeches. I was absolutely terrified about giving my speech, as was the best man and the father of the bride. After about an hour and a half of being in the venue, I'd hoped everyone had forgotten. They hadn't. Luckily, I didn't wing it like I originally planned. My friend Alana convinced me to write everything down, so I wrote honestly and I ended up with a speech that was packed with humour and emotion. I can't tell you how to deliver it, but writing mine went something like this. Thank all who came. Tell the story of how you met, 
Remember the ones who couldn't make it. Compliment the bridal party. And turn on anyone that heckles. I have been to weddings where speeches were clearly copied from the internet and never rehearsed. Always speak your own words and you will never go wrong. Fight the emotions when you need to, then just run with them. Number 10. Afterthoughts. Stay true to your original plans. Don't change them for the convenience of your guests. Compromise if you have to, but make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. This is a great occasion to hire everyone you know. Don't ask for discounts, as they'll probably give you a good price anyway. For decorations and small bits, Poundland is your friend. Don't underestimate a good car boot sale. There are plenty of cool things you can get cheaply that you can take to the venue and then just leave there. Don't put off planning. Make a deal with your partner that once per week you plan more of the wedding. Because you may feel like eight months is a long time away, but I can tell you from experience, it isn't. The older generation require old-fashioned invitations. They just don't get the Facebook invite. Bride and groom, bring a change of clothes. Anything can happen. These were just my thoughts on weddings, but like I said, do it your way. If you enjoyed listening to this or you think a friend or somebody else you know may be getting married, forward it on to them, tell them to have a listen, or read it on my blog, it will be on there. It's just joshmaddox.com forward slash blog. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.